Good morning, everyone. I am delighted to be here with you this morning. Um, I am in the uh, state of Virginia in the United States, and uh, my work has been uh, with education for the, uh, the better part of 35 years now. I am very interested in how students learn and how, how learning has changed uh, over the last few decades uh, specifically. Uh, we see students all the time that come into our classroom and they're very different whether they be children or adults or older adults or whether we're involved in training, human resource development, uh, all those types of things and the, the learning has changed and the delivery has changed. Someone compared learning to what we would call as being in permanent white water and that is in water that is always churning and moving around and how do we adapt and how do we learn and how do we foster those kinds of skills when everything around us is changing considerably. So that has been my interest for the better part of the last 20 or so years. I am a professor, I teach in higher education and I'm an online professor so that means that I work with students all over the world um, most of them in their doctoral program and their doctoral studies so not only are we delivering uh, higher order thinking and higher order learning using the online platform, we also have to uh, teach students how to become highly self-directed and how to learn on their own because that's part of the requirement of, of a doctoral student. What I am interested in is how learners interact and how do we work with students, sorry, how we work with students in new ways and how do we embed the contemporary skills and the qualities of creativity and curiosity and self-direction and problem solving and persistence, all those kinds of things that we know from the literature that are very important for the 21st century learner and how do we adapt our programs and how do we as educators and teachers, how do we work with students to develop those kinds of skills. I sometimes compare the world to our backyard. Uh, when I was growing up, we had what was called a community and a yard that we played in. And now the yard that we have is connected through technology. And we have interactions, just like I'm having today, with you all uh, from across the world. And we're connected by all these different types of technology uh, in ways that we can communicate and we can see each other and we can hear each other. So we, we're working to not only learn from one another, but we're, lear we're learning how to collaborate and communicate, not only for our own work, but for our socialization and for cultural understanding. I think the interest in how we teach that crosses cultural boundaries is a fascinating one and how do we adapt and work in this environment uh, that may have students that uh, come from very diverse backgrounds. I've traveled all over the, the globe and every place I go my, my interest is how do I work with people and individuals and communities that are very different from what I uh, have experienced myself and I find that the common denominator is that we're all interested in learning and we all want to learn. I learn from them as much as they will learn from me. I went to Hungary some years ago uh, and spent six weeks and someone asked me what was the most important thing that you uh, learned as a result of that experience from being in hung Hungary for six weeks and what I said was I went as a teacher but I became the learner and I think that's so important as we share and we use this technology today to um, collaborate and work together. All of the tools that we have available today, I, I could probably have slide after slide after slide, uh, but all of these things deal with mobile technology, the internet, the World Wide Web, e-tools, social networking, uh, Twitter, webinars, YouTube, uh, MOOCs, Facebook, podcasts. These are all the different ways that we can connect using technology and so really what we have now is this sort of global community of learners that we're able to share and to do things in real time um, and, and we'll, we can transition from one platform to the next. For me, using my phone 
uh, using the mobile apps that are available on my phone are absolutely wonderful. Uh, I travel, so being able to use my phone to check in on an airline, being able to read emails, to use FaceTime, to communicate with people and see their face, is, it's an amazing thing to see what has occurred, I think, over the last De two decades in particular, but what's of more interest is to see what's going to occur and what's going to happen over the next few decades. I try to envision what the world is going to look like. I have small grandchildren. They have grown up using an iPad from the time they were, you know, a year and a half old. Their experience with technology is very different from mine and even from that of their parents. So how is it that we get connected? How is it that we stay connected and how do we use this technology platform to do that and in doing so how do we foster and work with the kinds of skills that we need to prepare our learners for, for a future world. Many of the uh, statistics now will say that the jobs that our children and young adults will have are not even in existence. They're not even out there right now. So how is it that we can work with with folks and people and children to prepare them for a world and a, a profession that's not even in existence yet. It changes so very quickly. Well, so we're connected in every aspect of life, distance, time, geography, language, all of those things that were barriers years ago are no longer barriers. And we can understand the efficiency and we can see the effectiveness of technology integration and how our learners are interacting. But what's going to re really require us as educators and policy makers and those that are in a position of facilitating this type of learning really uh, to understand how, how, how do we teach students in this platform and how are they going to learn and how are we going to embed the kinds of skills that they're going to need not only to be successful in an online e-platform e but the kinds of skills that they need uh, for the future. And we have to be very deliberate about that and we have to be very intentional about that. We can't just assume that this is going to happen. Many places that I work with uh, in, in education are very interested in how to embed technology in, into their curriculum and into their teaching. And that's one aspect, I think, of what we're trying to do. But I think the other aspect is what are the kinds of skills that we're trying to foster in our students so that they can use the tools in a very successful manner. Wagner, um, in his book, The Global Achievement Gap, really recognize some of the skills that are so impo important for the 21st century learner and how is it that we're going to survive in, in this, new, this new world. And he talks about things such as critical thinking and problem solving. I think those are two of the, the most important types of cognitive skills that we can foster uh, in, in learners. How is it that we get them to evaluate, not only evaluate the kinds of problems, the real world problems that we're trying to get them to solve, but how can they evaluate and critically think about the amount of information that is out there. We have students now that think because something is on the World Wide Web that it's, it's true. Uh, I have students say to me, well, I got this information off of you know, some, some site. And they're not in that position yet to critically evaluate not only the utility of the information, but the efficacy of the information. Is it absolutely uh, correct information that they're trying to uh, cite and trying to use? How do we teach them to problem solve using authentic types of experiences uh, that um, take the relevance of what the content is and apply it to a real world, real world, world situation? We teach content. But when you can apply that content to new and different settings, then what you've done is to expand uh, the types of thinking that you're engaged in. You learn something in one context, but you're able to apply it uh, to new situations is a very important skill uh, for the future. How is it that we collaborate and work together across uh, platforms and networks? And how do we develop leaders who are able to lead by influence? Are you agile? 
are you are you quickly able to uh, work in this type of setting and do you have a mindset of a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset are you adaptable are you adaptable can you tolerate ambiguity can you work in situations where you don't know the answer but yet you're willing to find and seek out the types of answers that you might need do you have initiative can you can you take responsibility for your learning for what needs to occur and can you lead on that type of initiative no longer are we in settings uh, and, and in uh, corporate environments even even where everything is top-down now we expect our workers and our business people and employees to be able to think and act and uh, and take the initiative and to be entrepreneurial uh, that's how new things occur. People who have that entrepreneurial mindset are able to take something small and to enlarge and, and extend that in ways that uh, were never have never be before been seen. Are you still able to communicate? Uh, I know here in the U.S. what we see uh, and what we get uh, a lot of a lot of text, very big on text mes messages, and as a result, what we've seen is sort of a, a slandering of how people communicate they're using all sorts of acronyms and shortened words and I think that is you know certainly very appropriate for things uh, is in text but in the business world and in certain settings that type of effective that type of uh, communication is not effective in terms of the quality of it so we still have to be able to communicate both orally and written how do you access and analyze information? Can you take multiple pieces of information? Can you put them together to form a holistic picture? And can you evaluate and analyze that kinds of information uh, to come up with what is considered to be an effective uh, understanding of it? And do you have curiosity and imagination? These are two very important skills. You know, we're born very curious. We're born wanting to learn. And what happens to some of that, I'm not sure, as we develop in, into our adulthood. Uh, but can you remain curious and can you question things? Uh, I have a quote, one of my favorite quotes, and it talks. Uh, it says that uh, if curiosity killed the cat, then the cat died nobly. And I think that's very important that we maintain that curious mindset and that we're able to view and see things uh, from different perspectives. And I think these are the kinds of skills that uh, not only help us and facilitate our own learning and able to learn on our own, but they also help us to engage and to interact with learners across the world. Uh, as you go and travel, uh, the, more, the more curious you can be about uh, the different places and the different people that you're meeting, I think the more that you're able to learn and, and uh, evaluate. So we know that our employers say that not this is globally, that there is an in increasing demand for independent thought and a high level of problem solving ability from workers at all levels in the modern workplace. These are the kinds of things where they're looking for an independent thought. Decades ago and generations ago, when an employer wanted uh, an employee to learn something, often they sent them out uh, to some training facility or sent them to some school uh, and said, go learn these types of things and come back. Really, employers don't do that anymore. The learning is very specific. It's very focused. It is very tailored to the type of uh, environment, working environment that one is in. It's not efficient nor effective to send someone away to learn. Now they may say, you need to learn how to do this, whatever this might be, and they expect the uh, em employee to go f find the resources that they need to be self-directed and find find the answers. It's so interesting to me to be able to find anything on the web and to see uh, YouTube and to see how things are done in real action. So no longer do we have to send off or even sometimes bring people, hire people to come in to do things. We expect our employees to be able to do that and do it well. This is probably one of my uh, uh, more interesting slides as it compares the expectation of employers for employees between 1970 and now. This is perhaps your uh, parents' generation or even your, your grandparents' generation in some instances. If you go back and you look at the kinds of skills 
that employers were looking for in 1970. And you can see that they're rank ordered here, starting down with writing as being the most important one in 1970, and then computation and reading. You can see that in 1970, the emphasis was very much on skills. It was skill-driven, skill-led. Um, and what, what was at the bottom end of that was how you worked uh, in a team, or how you problem solved, and how you collaborated. Uh, it was very different. And so the kinds of interpersonal skills that you may have needed to develop in 1970 were, were different than they are now. If you look now, and you look at the kinds of skills that em expectations that employers are seeking from their employees, what they're really looking for are people who can collaborate, people can work together, they have strong interpersonal skills, and it's almost reversed. It is reversed. And what, what you can see now is that the skills, skill-driven things like computation, writing, those types of things are very much uh, not quite as important to an employer as are the things that relate to being able to collaborate and work together. And I think technology has expanded that. Technology has a, a fostered that sense of teamwork and problem solving and communication. Even in our learning settings, in a formal setting, in classes, we often put students, children, adults, in groups and give them a real life scenario of some situation or some event and ask them to collaborate and to work together such that they can come up with a solution. So you can see that, th that skills are very important in many ways, but now we're looking for these other types of skills that have to do more with the individual and how, how they can work and collaborate together. If you take a look at the slide here that looks at the various generations, and particularly focus from generation X, Y, and Z, Generation Y is really uh, the majority of the working adults that we see today, often called the Millennials and Generation Next. They have lots of subcategories that are within Generation Y, and then we also are coming up into Generation Z right now. Within each generation, what you will find are that the ways that they have learned, the ways that they have been educated, the ways that they've been taught, as well as the kinds of skills that were predominant are, are very unique and particular to that generation. And so what will be exciting is to anticipate uh, how the generations will look uh, over, over the years to come. So let's take a little bit about what this might mean as we think about teaching and learning. So Generation Z, born after 1994, before 2004 roughly, uh, they're in their teens, they're young adults, and they are really very different from the earlier generations. This is really where you're able to start now to see evidence of how technology has impacted a, a generation of learners. It's still in a stage of evolution and there's still many things yet uh, to learn in life. What is unique is that they live in the virtual world and they reach out to anyone, any place through the internet. Uh, they are less likely to travel, and they're less likely to step out of their homes for anything. Uh, they're very comfortable using the, uh, the e-tools, the internet, their phone, uh, all the mobile apps, Facebook, Twitter, uh, social, all the social media and networking types of things. Uh, that's how they interact. That They live almost in a virtual world. What you do see is that they lack sometimes uh, expression and their verbal communication and confidence and interpersonal skills uh, sometimes suffer as a result of being so uh, immersed into this e-world and where this will play out is when they're in the workforce. They may not get along with Generation Y who are exactly the opposite. Uh, nearly 18 percent of the world's population is this Generation Z, Z kids and so we have to consider how we're going to work and interact with them. They believe the internet is their birthright. They don't believe in commu uh, commuting to work. They like to work from home. Uh, they like to do everything they can uh, using a mobile technology. They can uh, order anything they want offline. They can do now mobile transaction banking, take a picture of a check, upload it it's into their account. Uh, they can live in one place uh, and never leave that room, so to speak, and yet accomplish all that they need to accomplish. So this technology uh, for them is, is 
their way of life. We may see something as a phone. They don't see it as a phone. They see it as a tool. They have a cell phone or an iPod, and they are highly dependent upon this technology. They're very individual in their character, and they believe in their own persona. So they're very much, we've gone to now a generation that is very much into themselves uh, and their ability sometimes to connect and to live uh, following the rules that are the social expectation is something that they challenge. Um, so their world exists on the internet and they speak their mind. They've used the internet to do that, uh, to speak freely and say things, sometimes to their own detriment, and they express their own opinions. They really are poor listeners. Uh, they don't have a lot of regard for what others have to say. Not everyone, but these are characteristics of many of them. Uh, education and work plays a minimal role as they don't see education as a means to survival. They regard intelligence and knowledge about technology as being the most important thing, and they are the, the fastest and quickest generation to seek out, find, uh, implement, and utilize the latest technology. Um, they were born during this digital age, the, the, the digital boomers we call them in some cases, and they adapt to education like no other generation. See if I could get this to move. Sorry. So let's talk about self-directed learning. Let's transition from what we know about learners and let's talk about self-directed learning. I am a huge advocate uh, and a researcher of self-directed learning, and I think this is uh, the ability of one to take responsibility to learn whatever it is that they need to learn. Futurist Magazine has said that self-directed learning will be the most important skill taught uh, in the future, for the future, and I think this is very true. And we have to consider this now in light of these generations. So think about what we just talked about with uh, the, the generations and how this may, what this may look like if we're teaching them to be self-directed. My work has focused in the field of uh, desire, initiative, persistence, and resourcefulness as a self-directed learner. And what does it mean to exhibit these types of skills? So the work uh, uh, on initiative by my colleague, Dr. Ponton, has defined initiative as being one that is goal-directed. We know the importance of setting goals, and we know the value of setting goals. And we know that people who set goals and work to, towards those goals are, are more likely to achieve those goals. You have an action orientation. Um, I know many people who set plans, but they never go to the stage of action. If I need to learn something, can I quickly adapt and orientate myself to that action part of, of learning? They have persistence in overcoming obstacles. They take an active approach, and they're self-started. Self-startedness is very important when you think back to the kinds of skills that were identified as important 21st century skills. This, these are people who can self-motivate. They can self-start. They don't need someone to tell them what to do. They need to learn something. They go and learn it for their own satisfaction, for their profession, for their employment, whatever it might be. The work on resourcefulness by Dr. Carr talks about the importance of being able to prioritize learning over non-learning. We live in a world now that we are inundated by information. We learn and know more than any other generation and can find and access information. Uh, so how do we keep that learning as a top priority? How do we engage in learning activities as opposed to non-learning? This is what it means to be resourceful, not about getting to stuff, about being resourceful, about thinking about the learning in terms of the future benefits and how do we solve problems. The work in persistence is so important, I think, for people in the online uh, uh, format. Being able to persist and to stay with a learning that you're having through the uh, e-platform can sometimes be very challenging for students. You have to be uh, have your own volitional control, and that is that you have the will to make yourself do something. Are you able to self-regulate your behavior? Can you self-manage your behavior? And can you work and persevere towards goals that you've set? These are the kinds of skills that we've worked with in terms of uh, being self-directed. Uh, and, and the importance of each one is uh, work that we've done in research for a number of uh, years now. 
in terms of global leadership and having a global nine mindset. So we have learners and we have learning that occurs, but how do we have leaders that are able to facilitate and develop that environment? And so we have to consider leaders who have this curiosity and concern with context. You know, not everything is applicable uh, the same way. So we have to contextualize what it is that we want our learners to do. Can we accept, this is getting back to uh, tolerance of ambiguity, can you, can you accept complexity and its contradictions? Uh, so you're not stopped by uh, obstacles that may appear to be a, a contradiction to what you're learning, but can you accept it and work around it? Are, are you diverse and do you consider the needs and sensitivity of others? I think these are folks that seek opportunity and surprises and, and uncertainties. For me, the most, some of the most fascinating learning that I've had is not in the answers that were confirmed in my research, but the answers that were not confirmed. And when I found answers that were, were very much a surprise to me, what gave me that aha sort of moment and made me question and go back and continue to do other research. You have to have organizational processes, you have to focus on continual improvement, you have to understand time for what it means with learning, and you have to have a system orientation. So this is a little bit about my work that's been done, what it means to be a continuous learner and to engage in learning throughout the lifespan, and what it means and what it looks like in terms of uh, facilitating the the learning process, but the teaching process as well, because they are not uh, isolated, they are not um, dichotomous in the sense that they're, they're not connected, they are very much connected and they go hand in hand. So we have to consider both uh, and what the students bring to the table and what we bring to the table in, in terms of our own experience as, as a learner. So I'd uh, be glad to answer any questions that you might have now and look forward to any discussion. Well, thank you very much, uh, Doctor, for a very interesting presentation. Folks, we are now open for the question and answers. If you have any questions, you could put it in the question box or you could raise your hand. There is a hand icon available on the webinar console, so if you click on it, you can directly have an audio chat with uh, Dr. Marcia. So let me go to uh, the first question we have. Doctor, what advice would you give to those who are becoming victim of information overload? And it is very challenging to continue the span of attention while learning that yes. is required uh, being receptive to information being thrown to us from all corners and with high frequency. That, that is absolutely uh, an, a wonderful question. Uh, and I think it gets back to uh, the effectiveness and the efficiency of what it is we're trying to do. We are inundated by information. We're on information overload. Uh, we have more information coming at us than any other time. And I think part of what we have to do is to be able to prioritize the kinds of information that we get and also be able to evaluate uh, the information in terms of its usefulness to us. I think it is very hard for students and for, for learners uh, to be able to process uh, all of the different ways that we're getting information. You know, we can't get away from it. Even if you're on a, a holiday, you're now taking uh, some form of a technology tool with you and you're, you're accessing information all the time. So I do think it's important that we learn how to evaluate uh, the kinds of information that we're getting and to be able to prioritize what's important to us and what is not. I, I just recently talked to a colleague of mine uh, about online learning and how now what we see in a lot of our online courses is every tool that is available is now uh, pushed into a course and having every tool and every possible way to interact uh, using these tools is not always the best form of learning. So I think we as uh, educators and professors and those that are in uh, human resource development, those types of things, have to consider what we are asking people to utilize. Just because a tool is out there, uh, uh, Twitter, uh, it is social networking, wikis, all of those types of things, blogs, that does not mean that it's necessarily appropriate for the kinds of learning that we're asking what to do. But you're, you're absolutely right. I'm not sure how we're going to be able to get away 
from the inundation of information. Uh, I do think we have to retrain our mind in some ways because we get information so quickly. We don't have time to reflect. We don't have time to process the information. And I think this is something that we're, we're going to, uh, it's, it's a penalty for us in some ways because without reflection and out time, without time to process, I don't think we really are able to digest a lot of the learning that we need to, um, uh, that, that we engage in. So I, I think it's something we're going to have to have discussion with and to think about and to consider uh, as we go forward with that. But that, that's an absolutely uh, wonderful question. I myself sometimes feel very overloaded with uh, all of the technology because I have to use so much of it. And uh, the ability to have conversations, to write, uh, uh, and to reflect upon things, uh, I think suffers as a, as a result. But your, your ask a pose a very, a very good observation and one I think we can have a greater discussion on as we move forward. Thank you very much. We have another one from Mr. Paul uh, Greasley. The question is, regarding multicultural aspects of learning, how do you merge students from different backgrounds with different skills into cohesive in learning environment? Thank you. Another excellent question. I've uh, worked with students uh, from all over the globe and, and done training uh, in, in situations and settings with students, adult students, whose skills are very different uh, than maybe other students I have worked with. I think we have to consider always uh, the culture uh, and the background, the skills, the experiences that a learner brings to the table. I don't necessarily think that because their skills are different that they are underprepared or do not have the capacity or the capability to learn. I think much of that has to do with their own um, experiences that they've had in education. It, we all bring culture. I bring my culture. I bring not only culture of being a professor of higher ed in the U.S., but I also bring my culture from how I grew up as a child in a, in a very poor environment uh, uh, in an area that geographically is very different from where I am now. So we bring all these things to the table. I did a study some years ago with a colleague and we, we tried to understand uh, the role of culture in learning when we worked with a group of educators uh, and we got them to confront uh, through reflection in many uh, instances their own biases, some that they're not even aware of. I think most people are not even aware of what uh, their biases are as a learner, as a teacher. So not only is it understanding the learner that you have, but understanding what you as a facilitator uh, may have as a preconceived notion and understand that. But I think the joy that comes with dealing and developing sort of an intercultural competence is that you're able to work with people, collaborate, learn from them uh, from all over the globe. So I think, uh, you know, again, there's, I think there's more for us to, to do in this area. I think experiences are absolutely vital. Uh, and I think we have to have people who are willing to uh, put themselves in, in situations, both teachers and learners, that um, what they've had experiences with prior to are very different. So for me, for example, to go to Kenya and to work with uh, Kenyan educators in very rural, uh, isolated types of places as well as to work with them uh, with technology for which they had a deep hunger for and a deep longing for uh, it was absolutely uh, one of the uh, highlights of my educational career. I still call, you know, talk to many of them and we try to find ways that we can continue that collaboration but I think for future generations to come we're going to see this uh, sort of cultural aspects play a more prominent role uh, as, as we try to understand how we facilitate that learning for diverse learners. But I think uh, you have to be receptive, I think you have to be open, I think you have to go in, as for me as a professor, to go in with the mindset of where can I take a, a, a learner, where are they, and how can I facilitate their development in such a way that their learning is, is extended, but to also understand 
what they bring to the table in terms of their own cultural background. And I have to recognize that and accept that. And I have to value and respect this, the norms and the social mores and the ways that they have um, engaged in their community. So, uh, but I think experiences are key. I think that is absolutely uh, the uh, a, a critical opportunity for us to seek out and uh, to learn from one another. Thank you very much. Another one, do you see campuses around the world are going to be seized in the near future, considering distance learning is becoming quite popular now? I think we will see the continued expansion of online learning, and I think we, we now find that uh, having buildings, bricks, mortar, you know, physical space uh, is not always uh, uh, needed. I think we also look for ways to utilize existing structures for online learning in ways that have not been done before. You know, if you have a, if you have a class, I'm in the U.S. and let's say I have a class in China, well, we we don't really need physical space. I, I so I think you're going to see some diminishment of that. I think there will be maybe a hub for a campus, but I think as more and more people uh, go into online learning and use those tools, you might see some shrinking of the physical space. But there also, it's also very important, I think, that we connect with people uh, in some ways. Uh, if you can't physically uh, meet them or see them, but to use you know, FaceTime and Skype and those you know, webinars that you can use the, uh, the video with so that we can see each other because we often, uh, just using the written word, uh, cannot communicate uh, in ways that uh, we might we might be able to gain more from seeing something visually, uh, I think is what I'm trying to say, than always just using the written word. So I think we're we're going to see that you know this this campuses. Uh, I think we're going to see a greater expansion, but I don't think we're going to see the physical space necessarily, but maybe more of a hub where education, many institutions can work and collaborate together. I think it's a, a great strategy for institutions to work together and do exchanges uh, between students and, and their, their faculty and professors so that you can gain those kinds of real life experiences of what it's like to be immersed into a different learning environment, a different culture. And I think those are the kinds of things that we should probably try to foster and work toward. Perfect. Uh, what skills need the most for effective learning? Oh, <laughs> well, there are a lot of skills, I think. I think, but I think uh, for, for, for individuals who like to learn, who are excited to learn, who want to learn, have a desire to learn, I think this is probably a, a sort of the catalyst that sets things uh, in motion. You know, people can be highly resistant to learning. Not, uh, some people uh, just don't want to learn anymore. They're done. And I think those who are who continue to learn and, and embrace that attitude throughout their lifespan continues to grow. So I think having the skills, I think having you know competence, of course, is important. I think people, I think if you read a lot, I think reading is absolutely a wonderful way to engage the mind through content. I think dialogue with other folks, those are those are great skills. Collaborating, working together. Being able to communicate, being able to communicate across multiple platforms is important. But I think for effective learning, uh, you have to be willing to set goals for your learning and goals that you work toward. And uh, those, those goals that you set for yourself of your own free will for which you have control over are more likely uh, goals that you're, are going to be achieved. So sometimes we set goals that are very uh, complex and very um, rigorous for us. For example, uh, uh, obtaining an educational degree. Uh, you know, students start their academic career as a, maybe as a young student, and they, they have to visualize, let's say for undergrad, something that's four years out and to work toward that goal. And so you have to be able to be diligent. You have to be able to persist. You have to be self-motivated. You have to be the, have those kinds of uh, cognitive and motivational skills, I think, that will see you through to a successful end. I work with doctoral students online, and I tell them when they start their program, don't 
you know, having a very distal goal of obtaining the doctoral degree is very important. That, that, that's why you started the program, but you also have to set more proximal goals in terms of completing assignments and getting through uh, a course and getting through a semester. And every goal that you achieve puts you one step closer to that more distal goal. And so you eventually, you know, reach that point. But, you know, wavering motivation can be a problem. People sometimes give up. Um, you, I think you have to be able to prioritize, as we talked about with a little bit with Dr. Carr's work, you know, keeping the learning of a focus even when there's other things that are going on. So, you know, to be effective, you have to be able to, you know, engage in the learning and apply that learning uh, and work toward learning sometimes that can be, uh, it should be a challenge for you. Uh, that's the type of deeper thinking that you're going to uh, learn to do and this, that's the engagement that comes with uh, working toward things that are a little difficult. So from, in my mind, being an effective learner employs all those types of skills. Of course, having the, the competence as well uh, and having the uh, foundational skills are also very important. Sometimes people are lacking in foundational skills, and, and, but there's ways to, to gain the kinds of knowledge that you might need to set you uh, in, in good stead toward being su successful toward more rigorous types of learning goals. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another one from uh, Brother Hassan Tamimi. The question is, how to know the best tools of learning and knowledge transfers in such changing oriented environment? Well, I think it might be changing right as we're, right as we're talking today. Uh, I, I think the technology is changing so quickly for us that uh, there are new tools that are available you know, all the time. I think we have to find the tools that work for us. Uh, just because, again, we have uh, you know e-tools that are out there, uh, and that some may use. That doesn't mean that everyone it's appropriate for everyone uh, to you know utilize. So I think we have to evaluate the kinds of tools that are effective for what we're trying to accomplish and what we're trying to do. I think it's also important that any time that we can take learning and that we can apply that learning, uh, that knowledge to our uh, either our profession, our career, our life, our family, whatever it might be, I think that knowledge transfer is uh, the most effective type of, of learning that we can have, that we can apply it. I think knowledge without application is a, is a missing link. I think that is, um, I think I know many people who have a lot of knowledge about some content and yet their ability to effectively apply and use that knowledge uh, is uh, is very limited. You know, there's a expression we talk about professors and researchers who are sort of in an ivory tower, and and I think sometimes that is a, a very accurate way of thinking about it. But in our current world, in our current future world, we we have to be able to get out of that tower and be able to apply and utilize the information. So I think that knowledge transfer, the type of tools that we do that with will be very much determined by the ind individual and the context that they're working in. I teach online, so if I don't have the right tools that I need for online, a uh, computer, the internet, phone, those types of things, um, that's a uh, video camera, uh, then I'm, I'm going to be not as effective. But I might not uh, have need to you know, have other types of uh, platforms uh, to, to to embrace them with my own teaching. It's good to try them, I think, but I think you have to evaluate that and you have to consider the context that you're in. Thank you. We have another one, short one, a personal one from Brother Abdullah Shire. What is the best way okay. for continual learning for me, a 55 years old, online education? Um, well, I, th I, think, I think we never stop learning never stop learning throughout our lifespan and I think if you, I, I, there, I think we can think about learning in two ways we have formal learning learning that we engage in maybe you talk about online learning could be a class or a webinar such as this a, a, a broadcast of some type so we have formal learning uh, you know environments and settings but we also have informal learning learning that we engage in for our own sense of uh, satisfaction and purpose and need. 
if you ever meet someone who uh, is a, a very curious person and they've engaged throughout their lifespan in some type of learning for which they're interested in has nothing to do with perhaps their career but they they wanted to learn people become experts because they teach themselves so I don't think we're ever limited by age ever I think in this, I think it's actually an exciting time for those of us who are at that age that we can communicate and learn so much uh, about things that we didn't know before. I know that sometimes I turn on the news and I will learn something uh, that I think I'm fairly knowledgeable about, and something comes on for which I've not ever uh, known about, and I'm fascinated by that. I don't think you should ever consider age. I think that is. Uh, not something you need to do. You find what you want to learn about. You find a way to make that happen. You engage with, um, find the resources that you need, and they can be online. They can be through individual consultation, communication. There's all different ways to learn, but never stop learning. Never. I think that is how we have. Um, we, I think that's how we engage our mind and we maintain uh, a healthy mindset as we get older. So uh, I would encourage you to uh, find things that you want to learn about, uh, whether they be formal things you need education-wise or things that you're interested in, and those are the things that I would encourage you to continue to do. But don't stop. I, I don't think age is a limiter, is a barrier at all. Absolutely, age is not a barrier. Never stop learning, and the questions are nonstop coming also. So let me <laughs> <laughs> Let me go to another one from Mr. Barry Colby. The question is, how do you feel about Common Core with respect to national, international standards? Oh. <laughs> well, I was a classroom teacher when the standards movement started in the United States. And uh, as a classroom teacher and then a class as a supervisor. So I saw it from a teacher perspective as well as from uh, an administrator. I think there are advantages to a common curriculum. I think uh, having a common set of standards that we would expect all of our students to be able to achieve to, I think is absolutely appropriate. I think, I, I personally don't feel that Common Core or any set of standards, I'm in Virginia, so we have our Virginia standards, I think that we are not limited by the standards. I think what uh, has happened over the last decade or so that we've become so test focused that we've lost sight of how we can allow teachers and educators to deliver those standards. So I, 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 think, that, I think having some type of, of model, some type of um, format that we have some common ground that we can stand on because there's such, there's such an equity if, if not if we just allow uh, locales and I think you know states in some ways to uh, teach whatever then I think we have areas of, of poverty and areas where those students will not you know get the kinds of information and get the kinds of teaching it still happens even even with standards but I think uh, I think there's something that that is positive about Common Core or, or the Virginia SOL or the Texas standards, even those states that are not, uh, the few of them that are not part of the Common Core movement, but I think there are advantages. So I, I wouldn't necessarily throw them all out. I think what we have to get back to is uh, having more freedom in how those Common Core are delivered and uh, instructional delivery is designed. So I think that flexibility and that freedom uh, has been compromised somewhat, somewhat rigid and very prescriptive in many places. And I think that stilts creative thinking. And so I would, uh, while I support standards, I'm also a huge advocate of allowing teachers to use their own creative mindset and their own creative knowledge to deliver the content in, in multiple ways. That way, I, I think students with very diverse backgrounds and diverse capabilities and abilities um, still have access to the same uh, knowledge and to the same uh, content. Well, thank you very much, and that really brings us towards the end of the webinar. I really want to thank you, Dr. Marcia, for a very, very interesting presentation. Any concluding remarks that you would like to give before we dismiss out? 
Uh, thank you all so very much for the time. I enjoyed the opportunity to share some of my own uh, research and some of my own experiences. Uh, you have my uh, email is on the presentation if you have questions. Uh, something you want to follow up on, please do email me and I'd be glad to continue a discussion with you. But I th thank you and hope everyone has a wonderful day and I would content, you know, urge you to continue the learning. Continue to learn throughout your lifespan. I think that is uh, something that we try to, to be curious and to foster that and those skills uh, in our children and youth because I think those are the kinds of things that uh, without a, a deliberate and intentional focus on creativity and curiosity, self-directed learning that we will have learners who uh, become very stilted I think in the way that they view learning. So it was a wonderful experience and I thank you very much. Uh, the feelings are mutual. Thank you very much once again and really want to thank you on behalf of the Medina Institute for Leadership and Entrepreneurship, Mal, for this valuable yes. presentation. And thank you all of those who participated in this webinar and for a very interesting question that you posted. So uh, please uh, be informed that we are recording this webinar, so stay tuned to webinar.mal.org to access the archives and equally learn about our upcoming webinars and programs.